Well, good morning. It's nice to have all of you here with us this morning. I want you to think of something, this is something everybody can participate in. As we talk about temperance, who's in control, I want you to shut your eyes just a second. And I want you to imagine that you're laying in your bed and it's pitch dark, if you have pitch dark. You got to get up and go to the bathroom right now. No light. Can you find your way to that bathroom? Most of us probably can because we know where the toe smackers are at, right? Or we may have the dim little light or something that helps us, but at one time we knew that path to the bathroom. But that all comes because of training our minds over and over and over again. We're like that, that uh, donkey that just goes around in that certain path on that mountain. You get on those little trips where you can go up and go do these tours. Horses are the same way. They know exactly where they're going because they do it every single day. Mackinac Island horses too. But I want you to think about temperance. Who's in control? If you look that word temperance up in the Greek 1466, a katreia, meaning self-control, one who masters his desires, it's taken from a katres, which is 1468 for note takers, means temperance, strong in a thing, masterful in self-control. I'm sure we're all that, aren't we? We got self-control, no problem. It's under control. Till we hit that toe smacker, right? Then it all changes. I want us to keep that mindset in our mind as we go through this lesson today about uh, who is really in control in this temperance of being in self-control. A bit of help. Some of you may know what that is. That's a horse's bit. They'll stick that over the horse's head. That bit goes in the mouth and there's a set of reins so they can control that animal. Funny story I have for that, but I'll share that for a later time if you ask me about that, about horse riding. The text, though, in James chapter 3 and verse 3, James says, Behold, we put bits in horses' mouth that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Sometimes, though, we get those stubborn horses, don't we? They don't obey us. The horse, I'll give you a little insight anyways. Friends of mine had some horses. You get that one. Big, tall thing. Oh, ready to go. You just jump on it. Well, it followed the little horse everywhere it went. So we went for this long ride. And I'll tell you what, if you've never rode a horse before, it will beat your muscles to death. I don't know how or why, but every little jarring motion like that, Maybe that's why the Indians were so muscular and skinny. I don't know. But we we're headed on our way back, and this little horse decides to take off. Whoa, this one takes off. Hey, there's trees coming up. They don't care. Horses have their own path, and they don't care what's on them. This little horse went right under, and I had all I could do to lay down and still hold on. And that thing, you know, they go up and down when they're running real fast. Just barely made it. Her, boy, them branches went right upside of me. We got back, and later I learned that that horse had to have an attitude adjustment a few times. The owner used a two-by-four. So I can kind of understand why maybe it was a, a disgruntled horse, but uh, nonetheless, we, we rely on those bits to try and control for our own safety or to stop. In Exodus chapter 5, Genesis, Exodus, all the way back in the Old Testament, in chapter 5 and verse 2, some may ask the same question today that Pharaoh asked, or have that same statement. The Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. It's a sad thing, isn't it, today that, you know, we may hear or take for granted that we ourselves, um, uh, we have Bibles, some of us may have multiple Bibles, but there are some people out there, believe it or not, that don't even have a Bible, 
You know how many people in this town that has come to visit us, we gave them a Bible and they never had one? That, to me, that's hard to understand because we live in a modern time. We got air in our tires. We should have everything modern, as simple as a Bible. It's very humbling. It's sad to say, who is the Lord? Who is this Jesus Christ that you guys preach about on Sundays and Bible studies on Sundays and Wednesdays? Who is this Lord? I want us to think some may be afraid of the word of God too. Matthew chapter 17, first book of the New Testament, Matthew's account. Matthew 17, verses 5 through 8. This is Christ's transfiguration. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud, which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were sore afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus only. It would be a fearful thing to hear a voice from God. None of us or anybody that we've ever known or talked has ever heard the voice of God like this. This was a miraculous time. But to be afraid. I, like, I want to focus on a couple points here. What God said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He wasn't just pleased. Remember in days of creation, Genesis 1 and part of verse uh, or chapter 2 and verse 1 where he said, after this day I am well pleased. It is very good. Not just good, but it is very good. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. God gave that commandment to his disciples. Listen to my son, because what he is going to tell you, you need to tell other people about, and that's where it has to come generation after generation after generation. Keeping that faithful saying. Well, why do we got to listen to Jesus? In John chapter 6, 68 and 69 is why. John chapter 6, 68 and 69, Christ has the words of eternal life, in short. Then Simon Peter, Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. They believed it because they had heard these stories. They, they were with Christ and witnessed this. They needed a bit of help. Well, something we all have played on at one time in our life, a boat, maybe not a sailboat. There's a lot of different points you can make a sermon right out of that picture of that sailboat for sure. This one is titled Steer Clear. That little helm, or also known as the rudder, can do a lot. I don't know how many of you have ever been in a kayak, smooth bottom. They just kind of one stroke of the paddle and you're turned around. That main key, the keel in the middle kind of helps keep that sailboat from tipping over and stuff and kind of helps keep it on whatever way it's pointed. Whatever way it's pointed is determined by that rudder or the helm. You look at some of these great big ships, Great big brass propellers that we could all stand and never even touch just one of the little lobes of the propeller. And that rudder in size comparison to that boat or ship is really small. All you need is just a little bit. In our kayaks, when we go out in the summertime and we get going, a uh, crazy thing tried once. I got a great big umbrella for the sun. Put that thing between your legs and you drop her down and that wind takes it. Boy, you can just take right off. But you need some way to steer it so you're not just going, you drop that oar 
straight down into the water and keep it locked under your armpit and you can turn that thing and you can let that wind just take you right across. Then you gotta paddle back. So be careful if you ever try that goofy idea. James chapter three and verse four. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. That word listeth means steering purposes in the original. So we have to be careful on how we steer. We have to have some sort of control of the vessel that we're in, right? Otherwise, it, it could be scary. These new vehicles I see on TV, uh, they're coming out with, they're putting all these markers in the side of the roads. So when you take your hands off these vehicles, you can just let it drive for you. Isn't that the purpose we turned 16 years old so we could get that driver's license to drive? Now we're so lazy as a society, we just want to get in and let the car do it for us. I understand the understanding of that, but if we teach a generation never to drive a car, and guess what? Some big dummy in a plow truck takes down those reflectors that that car is relying on to keep it in the lane. Uh-oh, car's just going to stop. And, well, I don't know where to go. We're not training ourselves. That's the thing. We have to be uh, well-trained in what we do. We have to take responsibility for ourselves. If not, let the government take over. They'll help you with everything you need. Just trust them, right? That's with anything. I know there's some head shaking. I'm not getting on that tangent, but I'm saying you are in control of where your boat's going. 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 through 4. We all will turn, but in what way sometimes? In this life that we walk and we live in, and we're going to turn different ways, but how are we talking and how are we turning? How are we living? Paul told Timothy, he was a young evangelist, a young preacher, to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That doctrine is known as, in my words, God's guidance system. Some of us may know what a guidance system is. Uh, it relies when we don't have eyes, it's our eyes for us. If it's pointed in the right direction, it will make contact with the destination we so choose. God's word is there. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. That means at any time and every time, we have to be ready. That's not hard. You hold that steering wheel because as we were coming home last night, the followers behind us probably seen it, a uh, semi. Front steer tire, driver's side, blue, boo. Car was over on this side of the northbound Zilwaukee as you're going down the hill. There's the semi-trailer at that bottom off-ramp, the pickup truck in the ditch on the side of him. Sugar beets and all kinds of stuff all over the road. That's the worst tire in the world that you want to have go out on you is a steer tire. Send you right over. You have to be in control. In verse 3, for a time will come will they, when they will not endure sound doctrine. They take their hand off steering wheel. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching. The original said tickling ears. But after, I always think of Rod. Dad used to get him all the time. Vietnam era. Fought in Vietnam. He was jumpy for right reasons. Dad go up to him. He'd be just sitting there, just touch his ear. Boom! He'd come right up out of that pew, ready to punch. A tickling ear changes your focus, doesn't it? Because your focus over here, some Benny sandwich goes messing around with your ear, then it changes your whole focus. Now you got the doctrine of Christ, the Bible, God's word right here that we're trying to study, that we're trying to look at. Keep us on our hands, both hands on the wheel. Somebody distracts us. 
Timothy, be careful. You preach this because it's going to happen. And they shall turn their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables. Not sure the exact lingo how it goes, but it's easier to believe a lie that's been told a thousand times than the truth that's been told five times or whatever it was. It's a difference. It's easier to believe that lie. We talked about this morning. It's easier to remember the bad things that happen versus those one good things. People always remember those bad things about us. It's hard to bring those good things up. In 2 John chapter 1, 7 through 11, 2 John chapter 1, 7 through 11, I want you to think about the six, six knots. N-O-T-S. Six knots. And that's not for speed or rope or anything like that. 2 John 1, 7 through 11. Here again, we're warned for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Remember when we started out, the apostles, they, they believe this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear ye him. They believed, right? So they were pro-Christ. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. One who does not believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God is an antichrist. He's against it. In verse 8, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought. That word wrought means to work out. We've worked out. Don't lose those things that you've worked so hard for. But that we will receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. So that word doctrine means words of Christ. Hear ye him. Hath not God. He that abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. He that, he that abideth, sorry. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ. He hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. In the original text, though, in the Greek, it says, for speaking to him a greeting shares in the works of him evil. You go along with it, you're guilty by association in God's word. God's word, does it need to be polluted? Well, no, that's a dumb question, isn't it? But anytime man changes God's word, he's polluting it. He's tickling the ears. He's taking the wheels off, just letting things go on their own merit. We have to be careful and hold fast that sound word of God. So steer clear. Now who's in control? The kids will probably get this for some of us older people. Focus on what you can control and leave what you can't. It's a remote control for a gaming system. I thought that was the most powerful saying to go along with this lesson. Focus on what you can control. Just because somebody says something that you got to do something, does that mean it's so? No. Who's in control of your boat? One with the rudder, one with that oar. You give it up, you don't have no control. There's two options in God's word that we either we obey him or we forsake him. So we need to take control of our actions. That should be something positive, right? I'm in control of my own destiny. Okay, that's good. Now, where is your destiny? In Deuteronomy chapter 11, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way in the back. Deuteronomy chapter 11, I mean in the front of the Bible, rather, I say the back, I mean the Old Testament, in the front. Deuteronomy 11, 26 through 28. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if 
You will not obey the commandments of the Lord, your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. Israel's whole problem, right? God's people, they would, they, the Bible talks about they go whoring off into other gods. That led to a lot of punishment and troubles and trials that they didn't have to go through. Just like Mama said, don't do that and you won't have to worry about the consequences, Mama said. Oh, you know what, I'm smarter than Mama. I'm a teenager. I know everything. Yeah, we laugh because we all have probably have been there one time in our life. Who really knows best, though, for us? Our soul's sake. In Jeremiah chapter 9, 13 through 16, Jeremiah 9, 13 through 16, And the Lord saith, Because they have forsaken my law, which I set before them, and have not obeyed my voice, neither walked therein, but have walked after the imagination of their own heart. Uh-oh. Got it on our own, don't we? I'm in control of me. And walked after Balaam, which their fathers taught them. Their fathers should have taught them about Jehovah God, not Balaam or any other false gods. But they just let that slip through, didn't they? That's all right, son. Your oar is broke because you just wanted to use it like an axe on stuff, and I told you not to. That's okay. It's just got a little bit on. It'll still get you through in life. No. The purpose has been compromised what that ore is for. Verse 15, Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will feed them, even this people with wormwood, and will give them water of gall to drink. Funny, they did the same thing to Christ, didn't they? Soak the sponge, gall, I will scatter them among the heathen whom neither they nor their fathers have known. This is going to be a new, new breed of punishment that they have never seen before, besides Pharaoh and uh, others. And I will send a sword after them till I have consumed them. Pretty self-explanatory, their punishment for being disobedient to God. So in control, we need to steer clear of ungodliness. In James chapter 1 and verse 17, James a powerful book, powerful book, a lot of good food there to eat. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light with whom there is no variableness nor shadow of turning. You want somebody to depend on? Who's the best person that we could ever depend on? Someone that's going to be there for us, right? Hey, I need you to come and do this for me. You have no question that whatever you tell them to do for you, they're going to come and do it, maybe even better than what we've asked them to do. Those people are valuable. And I will say those people are far and few between today, right? But when we find them, we need to cherish that. That's a good attribute to have as people. I'm thankful for God that there is no variable. There's no turning back. He said, here it is, my word, hear ye him. Focus on what you control and leave what you can't behind. Now to clear it up, double vision. Woo. Yeah, a few years ago I had this problem. I'm sitting there at the kitchen table and I'm reading. I'm like, I know this Bible prints small, but this is ridiculous. So I would pull it back. Oh, well, here it is. Go along. It reminded me of a guy at work. He would do this. Squid. I'm like, uh-oh. I've crossed over. So I had to go get my eyes checked. I can see far away, fine. But that real small stuff getting blurrier and blurrier. So to have that double vision... Uh, if you have not had that, you're doing good, but hopefully you never have to uh, deal with that. 
Some things in life we need to clear up, right? We have to do it wholeheartedly, but when we have double vision, it will be confusing as well as unclear sometimes. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, now jump into the New Testament. Paul wrote to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Have we all seen beautiful things in our life in this world? Sure, many of you guys have been to very awesome places with the beauty. I've got to go a few different places. Psalms 19 and verse 1, The heaven declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Every time we look out, we see a beautiful sunset. Have you seen the same sunrise and sunset copied over and over again? Nope. Why? Because there's variables, isn't there, that every morning something's different. Temperature's different, the clouds. I can tell, you know, when I get up in the morning for work, I know where the sun's coming up. When the sun's going down, you can see that sun move through the seasons. <coughs> that just didn't happen from some big explosion. That was a creation from God. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament that we see show up as handiwork. But James said, if we jump back to James chapter 4, 7 through 8, James chapter 4, 7 through 8, if we want some clarification to help us clear things up, James said, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist. That word resist in the original means to oppose, to be opposite from the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw an eye to God, and he will draw an eye to you. Cleanse ye hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. We know double-minded people. In the original text, I thought this was pretty interesting. Two hearty, two hearted soul ones. Same thing, double mind. James 1 8 says the same thing about being double minded. A double minded or two hearted soul one. Man is unstable in all his ways. Why? Christ said, Let your yeas be yeas and your nays be nays. You're not very dependable if I say, hey, I need you to do this, and then you go over somebody else, and they say, well, I want you to do it this way. Well, then they do it that way, and then pretty soon you've got confusion. Don't be double-minded. Don't be double-tongued. You stick to what it is. If you're wrong, you're wrong. I've had to live with that. I've said a thousand times, and I'll continue to say it. I don't know everything about my job that there is to know, and if I mess up, I'm the big dummy, and I'll admit it, and that's fine, but those mess-ups that we're trying to prevent all of our kids nowadays, and everybody gets all these uh, competitive trophies, and nobody's a loser, we're actually hurting our young people because they're not going to know the right and wrong because, oh, it's okay. We see it in our schools, don't we? Boys don't know their boys now. Girls don't know their girls. Whatever I feel during the day, come on. We've lost it as a nation. What scares me is how God said he will give up nations and let them be overtaken. Israel was given up because of the sin. Our leaders, our government, not getting on that, but people that are in charge that should have some morals and conduct about it, it's went by the wayside. It's sad. That's why it's up to us to have control of where we're going. No matter what, Revelation 2.10, Be thou faithful unto death, and thou shalt receive a crown of righteousness in the church. We have to be in that boat that God is steering with his son to be saved. So when those storms come up, those trials, we're in something that we know that there's protection. What do we do as people sometimes? 
we do put on swimming trunks and we jump out, don't we? Because it's funner. Let's have some fun. You guys are too tight. Let's loosen up a little bit. Be careful. Be careful of our actions. Draw an eye to God and he will draw an eye to you. I want us to think about the heart, the double-heartedness. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 21. Proverbs is a book of wise sayings. Double-hearted, we've got two. We either got godly or worldly. Double-hearted. Proverbs 19, verse 21. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. What is he talking about? You're going to change your heart. You're going to change your mind because you're a man. Mankind. This isn't just written to men. Everybody's going to change their heart. Depends on what situation you're in. We'll go to the peer pressure. So clear it up. We need to clear things up in our life. We need to make sure what we're doing and get on that right path. This morning, have you died with Christ? I know this is foreign and it's kind of crazy sometimes to, to think about. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? You've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. What are you talking about? It sounds Satanistic, like a ritual, some may say, but that's not the case. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, and he said in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 5, remember, when he wrote these letters in the New Testament to these different uh, Ephesians, Romans, Colossians, Galatians, these were all ready churches that were established, the Lord's church. These were just members that Paul was preaching, much like me, on Facebook or uh, Zoom or whatever it is that we can put it on YouTube. It's just going out to them. And he reminds them, and he said in verse 1, And you he hath quickened, who were dead in your trespasses and sins. Romans chapter 6, 3 through 6, talks about when we're buried, we crucify that old man. We'll get into that here in a second. And he reminds them again, we're in time past. Ye walked according to the course of this world. Remember, there was two courses, God's way in Proverbs or the course of this world. According to the prince of power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. The verse 4, we'll skip through for time's sake, but verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. How did he love us? He gave us his only begotten son, John 3, 16. He took that hit for us. He took that cross that we should be nailed to for the sin in our life, but he took that. He took that part, but the sin that we do in our life is what put him on that cross to begin with. We don't think about that. Every time we sin, it's like nailing that Son of God back on that cross. That's what put him there. He had to sacrifice himself so we would have a way out. We wouldn't have to be crucified like that for the sins in our life. In verse 5, And when we were dead in sin, he hath quickened us together with Christ. Romans chapter 6, 4 through 6. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Christ had to walk on this earth. He was not baptized in this sense here. He was crucified on the cross, which was death. But we know that Christ, after the third day, he what? He was risen. That's why we assemble on the first day of the week, as Christ gave the order to, to assemble. When we, walking in this, notice the black sin for dirt, we go down. This man heard the word of God, believed it. In Acts chapter 2, we have that account that we're going through. Now we're into this. 
being planted together. In verse 5, 4, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man has crucified him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. We have to get rid of the sin. It's not this, because boy, if baptism worked, I hope I'd come out better looking, at least have some hair if that were to... That's not the case. It's a spiritual burial, a spiritual birth. Knowing this, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that we henceforth, we should not serve sin. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, I'm so thankful that God is the one that performs the operation. We learned about in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, it is God that adds to the church, not man. I'd never be worthy for some people. Neither would you. But you know what? It doesn't matter what other people think. It doesn't matter who we are, what we are, as long as we're willing to adhere to God's word, repent of the wrong in our life, do what he wants us to do. He adds those to the church. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 12, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith and the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. God raised his own son out of the dead just like he raised up to rise up to to walk in a new life. We got rid of that old man. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, and old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We're a new person. Over here, you know, yeah, the world's not going to Forget Bill over here. Even though Bill put on this new body, this new man, I've changed my ways. It's always fun, isn't it, when you walk into somebody, hey, you old dog, I ain't that old dog no more, I'm a new one. But they can't forget what you were in your past. I'm thank thankful to God that he's the one that I have to answer to and nobody else. Now then we get into Nicodemus. In John chapter 3 and verse 5, Jesus, because Nicodemus is like, oh, well, what are you talking about, Jesus? I'll paraphrase. Am I supposed to enter into my mother's womb a second time? No. No. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. This is the key to salvation. Hear the word. You believe that word. You're willing to change your life. You're willing to confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's like in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, here is water. What hindereth me to be baptized after he was just preached Jesus? Some people want that, man. Yeah, I know. I'm, I was a dirty dog. I know that. I want to get rid of that. I want to be a different person today. Who cares what the world thinks? Who cares what our friends and family may say about us? It's okay. Who do we have to answer to in the end? The one that's holding the rudder. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 22 and verse 23, and this lesson will be yours this day. Paul later goes on, after they had been buried with Christ, to rise to walk in that new life later on in that chapter. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness unto the everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If you'd like to study any more on that, if there's something that's just got, got you high-centered, you're stuck, I would like to study that with you. But then those of us that have obeyed the gospel, sometimes we lose our, our rudder in life, though, right? 
Oh, we got this. We want to be cool. Kick back, put our feet up. How many times that oar slides off on you? And you try and get it back. The wind takes you away. Sin can do the same thing to people. It can take us away from the destination that we want it to be, and that destination is with God. If we're doing things in public that we shouldn't be doing in public, it's going to cause a black mark on the church, Christ, and what he had died for. It makes a mockery. You need to repent of that stuff. If it's something that somebody's going to say, I'd be the first one to ask for prayers. So if you hear of something dumb that I might have done that's going to blemish the church and you as the body of church, I don't want that either. Thankful to God that if we sin in private, we can go to God in private. We don't need to air our laundry. We all got dirty clothes, don't we? Don't need to be aired out. If you need help with anything, please let us help you today as we come together and stand and sing.